So welcome to our um, online Game Changer Seminar Series of EC. This is the 10th seminar on our series on captivating cosmology from the Big Bang to tomorrow. And I am very happy to uh, introduce you Dan Skolnick from the Duke University in the USA. Uh, Dan received his uh, university degree at MIT in 2007. Then he received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University in 2013. And then he received several prestigious fellowships, uh, uh, the Hubble Fellowships, the Kavli Institute for Cosmology and Physics Fellowships. And he did then actually his postdoc at the University of uh, Chicago. Dan then became a professor at the Duke University, where he is now, and he has gotten the chance to start the Duke's cosmology program. And in the last few years, he has won a Packard Fellowship, Slowland Fellowship, and Department of Energy Early Career Award. And of course, congratulations for all these prestigious fellowships and awards. And now, of course, we are eager to hear about understanding the accelerating expansion of the universe and the Hubble tension. So um, then thank you once more for accepting to give this talk to our audience. And uh, we are of course very much looking forward uh, to hearing to your talk. Just a, a last small information for uh, for our um, or the people listening to the talk. So at the end of the at the end of the seminar, we have. You can ask in two ways your questions, one by writing your question in the chat or as a second uh, by raising your hands and then you will be unmuted. <clears throat> so um, then please, this the screen, it's yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for including me in uh, your seminar series. I got a chance to, to watch a bunch of the previous seminars and yeah. Uh, uh, I hope I can uh, do as well as them. It's really kind of a fantastic resource, I think, for the whole community. So uh, kudos to you all. Okay, so I'll be talking today about yeah, the accelerating expansion of the universe and the Hubble tension. The Hubble tension is now this kind of big thing that stubbornly is not going away. Uh, I, uh, I'll i be talking about kind of work from two teams that really have kind of like gotten married over the last year. So one is the Pantheon Plus team and one is the Shoes team. And a couple of my main collaborators are Dylan Brout and Adam Reese. And I'll just say that everything I'm talking about today, uh, except for kind of one part at the end, which is in a paper that'll come out next week, is all public. So the site is uh, Pantheon Plus Shoes GitHub.io. So if you kind of want to take anything that I'm talking about, and do your you think you like well, can can do better? Uh, feel free. I'm really happy to start a collaboration or answer any kind of questions. Um, and so all the data is there. Okay, so I I have two little girls at home, and I want to I, I always think in terms of this in terms of um, the Hubble tension. So I just want to give this this uh, analogy. So at least in America, when we, you take your kids to the doctor's office. Uh, your doctor, the doctor will kind of measure the weight and the height of your child. And then you, you the, those numbers will get put onto a, a chart that looks like this. And then, then they kind of predict, they don't really say this as much anymore, but you could read the line for yourself. They predict how big your child will be when they grow up. And I, I can't stand that this even happens or still happens, um, but it does. And uh, basically, we have, a, we have a kind of similar issue kind of technique for in cosmology right now, but uh, we have a, a really fantastic way of measuring the universe as a baby. This is kind of uh, looking at the signals from the cosmic microwave background. Um, and then and we have uh, a really good measurement of kind of how the universe is expanding today. This is what I'll be talking about using the distance ladder. And then we have this curve, which essentially is kind of our prediction. So kind of how you could take our measurement from a baby and infer kind of how big the, the, the baby's gonna be when it grows up. And that's our standard model of cosmology. So what we call lambda CDM, where you kind of have this cold dark matter and dark energy. And the, the kind of the, the summary of the issue now is that if you do this, this test, then 
then the, something doesn't work. If you take the kind of the, the inferred Hubble constant from the CMB, you know, using this model, it doesn't match where we, what we see today. And this is kind of in this five sigma tension. So there's kind of three places that could be, that could be wrong. One is how we measure the universe as a baby. The other is how we measure the universe uh, today. And the third is the model that we use to connect the two. And, uh, you know, I can kind of let everyone decide kind of where they feel about this, uh, th this question. Okay, so this is just a nice uh, cartoon, but basically there's kind of two numbers to keep in your head this whole time. It's that uh, the, the Hubble constant that the shoes team infers is, is 73. The Hubble constant inferred using uh, the early universe measurements and um, and and the standard model is, is 67 to 68, like 67 and a half or so. And yeah, this this is the tension. So kind of a lot of the things I may be saying are, are, you know, what's the difference between this 67 to 68 and 73? Okay. All right. So I want to kind of just summarize the the big ideas that of kind of how we're approaching this problem. And that's that we have this standard model of cosmology. We we know that 95% of it is you know dark matter and dark energy, which we you know readily admit we don't really understand what they are. You know, we think dark energy is a cosmological constant, but you know, our theoretical models don't explain that at all. For for dark matter, there's a huge amount of, of theoretical models, and none of them seem to do that well right now. So we're not in like the best place, but it, it works. Um, it works just about everywhere, except we're kind of having these new, these popped up tensions. And the, the biggest one is this, this, ten, this Hubble tension, the tension of the Hubble constant that I'll talk about, but it's not the only one now. And now there's a kind of Sigma eight tension and other things that people are talking about. Um, and the kind of the motivation is, all right, well, you know, if we're not so satisfied with this standard model, um, and we do have these tensions, then um, you, we should we should kind of really take these these seriously, and to do the measurement of the kind of expansion rate of the universe today, we we use what's called standard candles. So so objects that we kind of we know how luminous they should be. So if you uh, measure their brightness, then you could get distances. And and basically, if we're kind of really relying on these tools and they they are kind of really helping us or, or both to measure dark energy and to kind of show there's some Hubble tension, we should just kind of throw all criticism at them. So I just think, you know, these 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 are kind of important tools and we should just kind of come up with any possible thing we can to say how they could be wrong. And then, you know, try to try to see if, if that affects anything and 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 go from there. But um, like you basically go with the philosophy of just being totally open to criticism in our measurements before we say, hey, we need a new model of cosmology, which it may be the conclusion. Okay, so just to kind of show this in numbers, uh, so the this is from the the recent shoes analysis. But basically, we get a measurement of H of 73. Uh, this is in units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, you could see in the blue here that's that's Planck. This is the likelihood. It's 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 a little bit asymmetric because of some measurements that are in mag space versus flux space. But uh, you could see this is kind of hit that that five sigma level. And you know, kind of. If anything, the the tension just has continued to increase, and the kind of the H naught values on either side, the Planck side or the the shoe side, haven't moved much. Okay, so one kind of tell you about how we use both supernovae and and Cepheids, and I'm kind of start mainly focusing on on the supernova side. So on the left, this is the the, the distance ladder. So basically, there's three rungs of the distance ladder where in the first rung, you're using geometry, so something like parallax in the Milky Way, to calibrate the luminosity of Cepheids. And in the second rung, you're using um, you're using Cepheids, the, the, the kind of the calibrated self, Cepheids to then calibrate the luminosity of supernovae. And then the third reason, the third uh, uh, rung, you're using supernovae to then infer H naught. And basically, 
you the a measurement using supernovae of H naught is degenerate with the luminosity of supernovae. So that's why you need the first two rungs to basically break that degeneracy. So that third rung of the distance ladder is basically showing um, it's essentially kind of using redshifts and and brightnesses. And when we then measure when we measure uh, the equation of state of dark energy W or other cosmological uh, parameters, we're really basically kind of peeling off that that third panel there on the uh, right here, and we're taking this to higher redshift to measure dark energy. So on the right, this is from this is from the Pantheon analysis, and you can see we're going from a redshift of 0.01 past past one, and kind of how. Uh, how brightness is change with redshift tells you about how the universe is accelerating its expansion. Okay. Now, one of the most important things that we could do for either the distance ladder or the Hubble diagram, what we call the, the plot on the, on the right, is, is doing things as consistently as, as possible. Because if you're consistent, then systematics will kind of cancel out. And uh, so, so, whether you're dealing with Cepheids or supernovae, kind of measuring them the same way, zero points, uh, calibration, any kind of astrophysical systematics, you just want to treat them consistently, and then you 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 significantly reduce your your sensitivity. So I just want to kind of lead, lead, plant plant that idea. Okay, so for supernovae, they're, they're they're getting used in two ways here. So one way is for measuring the Hubble constant, and the other way is for measuring. Uh, W, the equation of state of dark energy, or Q naught, kind of the measuring the expansion history of the universe. And and while basically for for me, for since I uh, do the supernova side, uh, I, I essentially basically have to do the best supernova analysis I can. The use the use cases are kind of different. So for H uh, for H naught, we're essentially comparing supernovae. Let me just go back one side. We're, we're comparing supernovae in the second and the third rung. So that is supernovae basically at Z of 0.01 or a little bit less than 0.01 to supernovae kind of at 0.05. So basically you're comparing uh, the brightness of supernovae very close to us to supernovae pretty close to us. Now for W, you're really kind of using a much bigger redshift range and uh, like a delta Z of one. And for W, what we have to do is essentially measure any kind of deviations from some model uh, on the 0.02 mag level, which is tough. For H naught, the, the Hubble tension, you for kind of a smaller, kind of easier um, range of redshift about delta Z of 0.1, the, the tension itself is at the 0.2 mag level. So if we can do a measurement on W, an H naught measurement is almost like a hundred times easier. And I think this kind of point can get lost a lot. Like you know, people think, hey, we're doing well with W, but H naught is really hard. For the supernova side, H naught due to kind of, you don't have to worry about many evolutionary systematics or calibration changes with a small lever arm in redshift. And the scale of the problem is 10 times bigger. That's like kind of like a hundred times easier for measurement for us to do W than H naught. Now I could kind of just do everything but it kind of shows just how big the Hubble tension is. It's 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 a whopping signal um, of a problem uh, for for in kind of in light of, of supernova measurements. Okay, all right. So how do you actually do the supernova measurements? Uh, it's there, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of steps, and I'll just kind of quickly go over them. But basically, you know, you have a supernova it goes off in some galaxy. You have to worry about. Uh, the demographics of different supernovae and different kinds of galaxies, how you are selecting, discovering the supernovae. Then you have to kind of find the redshifts of all the hosts of, of uh, the host galaxies of those supernova. Then you, we, we have measurements that have kind of been taken by different telescopes. So you have to cross calibrate all of the different instruments, filters, um, and uh, different supernova surveys. You have to kind of try to model what each supernova survey, what their strategy was, so you understand the selection. Then you compile all the light curves. And then uh, kind of only after that, do you, do you actually kind of really do the measurements, which you, you do what we call standardization. So we say, all right, well, here's the differences between a different kind of light curves, where a light curve is 
how how the brightness of a supernova changes with time in different filters. And you say, okay, well, uh, let's standardize them. Let's see kind of how how the, br the observed brightness relates to different properties of those light curves. So that's what we do for standardization. And then we have to kind of figure out the covariance of all of the steps that have happened before. So kind of, you know, have you have you placed any covariance between any of these, these steps? And then finally, kind of after you do the standardization and measurement uh, for each light curve, you could put this on the Hubble diagram and you can measure cosmological parameters. Now, kind of this, this is done for uh, for the 1700 supernova light curves, 18 different surveys. It, it's a lot, but we've kind of kind of gotten really good at doing kind of full forward modeling. So basically, we have these big simulation packages where we're we know kind of what the weather was on one night on at one telescope and kind of we know that that whole history and that's fully going into everything that we're doing and we release kind of all those simulations and all those products as part of our data release but it's kind of it's gotten pretty i don't know intense okay so the kind of the primer is that that you say okay well you know luminosity at 10 percent so if you can measure um you know the apparent luminosity or the brightness at 10 percent um then the ratio of those two things can give you a luminosity distance. And if you can get the redshift independently from spectroscopy, then, then each supernova can be placed on the Hubble diagram. So on the right here, this is showing the light curves for supernovae at different redshifts. We're basically measuring kind of their decline rate, uh, overall brightness, a color, and you're putting your, your standards like those to get those on the Hubble diagram. Now, 24 years ago or so, the supernova you used to discover the accelerating universe, the signal that the two teams found was that supernovae were about 0.25 mag fainter than expected, uh, given the, uh, if you had didn't have a universe first with dark energy. Now, what's interesting is the Hubble, the Hubble tension is at the is about 0.2 mag. So the the discovery of the accelerating universe was kind of actually a pretty similar size signal as the Hubble tension, and I like to think that we have improved a lot in the last twenty five years. So it's kind of amazing that we have another signal of, of roughly this magnitude. Okay, so just to kind of hammer that improvement point in on the left, this is this is what the two teams used to discover the accelerating universe, where this was you know tens of supernovae and here the on the left the deviation is is uh to a universe with with no dark energy and you could basically see this 0.25 mag signal here uh in the middle this is from my 2018 pantheon analysis and here the model is is lambda cdm and you can just kind of see how much better our improvements have gotten um, on the right, this shows kind of in the constraints uh, of uh, dark energy versus matter, uh, not just dark matter. Um, and and you could see kind of in the black, this is the the contours before. Um, in the red, this is our our contours as a, a few years ago. So it's actually been a pretty amazing, straightforward march of progress where we kind of significantly increased the statistics now into over a thousand and also kind of significantly reduced a lot of the systematics. Okay, now with Pantheon and other analyses, we kind of have this picture of concordance cosmology. So um, this is this nice plot from uh, Natathar et al. And this is showing, it's not just like Pantheon supernovae or supernova set that's saying the universe has dark energy. Um, you get constraints from Planck, you get constraints from BO itself. The voids actually is pretty putting on it pretty interesting constraint now. And you know, if you just kind of had this, you say, all right, well, well, you know, you had this 10 sigma detection of acceleration, everything's kind of agreeing, everything's in a, in a good place. Okay, so we kind of want, even with that, there are a number of papers that said, hey, you know, there could be different issues with Pantheon that could affect Hubble tension or affect dark energy. So we essentially did this huge, uh, re not just reanalysis, but we, we we significantly increased the sample size uh, for Pantheon. So we call this Pantheon Plus. And we uh, we wrote a paper about every systematic that the community has kind of brought up to us and just tried to be 
totally open to kind of any possible problem. Uh, this is this is most of them. This has been a couple more. Um, and to kind of say once again, this this is kind of big uh, group I, I, I led with with Dylan Brown. Um, so I just kind of give a couple snapshots of of what what was in there, uh, but I won't go too far in. So uh, this is uh, uh, 1700 light curves, and the redshift range is all the way from 0 0.002 to 2.3. So huge redshift range, and basically for the previous Pantheon it did not have the very low redshift because we weren't really thinking of combining with shoes, which needs those very low, low, low Z supernovae because low Z supernovae, the, the redshifts can be uh, caused because significant uncertainties. But now we kind of did this, this Pantheon plus shoes marriage. So we kind of extended the redshift on the, on the low end. Uh, so we had 18 different surveys, 25 systems. One really nice thing is that for, for, uh, most uh, for so for all the supernovae that were in a Cepheid host that are important for H naught, we have at least two or almost always two different uh, telescopes observing them, so we could kind of check different calibration issues. And we now kind of do this analysis of all the supernovae which are in the, the Cepheid the Cepheid sample simultaneously with the Hubble Hubble sample, so we get to. Um, uh, uh, measure any covariances, and there's Ariana, my my uh, undergrad, who kind of helped with a, with a, with a lot of this. Okay, so one of the kind of big concerns is that we're using these supernova surveys from lots of different observed by lots of different telescopes, and the reason we have to do that is because there's only so many supernovae that have gone off very nearby, so nearby that you can measure Cepheids in nearby hosts. So we're kind of limited by. Uh, some some historic uh, samples, and we have to cross calibrate them. Now, one really nice thing that we've been able to do is there have been these all sky surveys. So on the top here, this is showing the kind of coverage by the Panstars all sky survey, and and it has observed you know most of the sky. It's a, it's a northern telescope, so we can say, all right, let's cross calibrate every past survey that's ever been because you know stars aren't changing that much. Um, and we can basically re-derive the photometric system of any past survey. So we do that. It's a it's a really laborious, uh, uh, hard process, but but it works. We then kind of can retrain our model, and we find kind of for each of these papers, we say here's how much it affects the Hubble tension. This affects 0.2. Uh, this affects less than 0.2. So you know, remember that difference that we care about is about six kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this is pretty small. Okay. Another thing that's kind of been pointed out is, well, you know, the Hubble diagram has two parts. One is those kind of standardized brightnesses, but the other is the x-axis of there. Those are the redshifts. There's been a number of papers that have said, all right, well, these redshifts kind of different groups have measured or something like that. Uh, so we actually wrote two papers on this, one kind of in the measurement side, another on the peculiar velocity side. And um, overall, we find uh, that the the kind of the the change that 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 uh, this big improved treatment does is 0.1 kilometers per second megaparsec. There's a great paper led by Anthony Carr. Um, so again, kind of if you if you look at the x-axis of the Hubble diagram or for the use the, the redshifts they use for the distance ladder, those also um, actually have a, a quite small effect. And that was kind of one of the big things that the community has kind of pointed at is maybe maybe there could be something there. Okay, another kind of nice thing that we said is that, well. Uh, let's just say you couldn't even cross calibrate and just let the data kind of self calibrate for you. Um, so this is this nice paper led by Sasha Brownsberger. And the data now has gotten so good itself that even if you kind of struggle to uh, do the calibration, then because H naught has super has supernovae from the observed by the same telescopes in different rungs, you have this really nice cancellation. And this kind of what I'm talking about this consistency issue. And and really poor calibration could only affect you at the kind of 0.2 kilometer per second uh, uh, per megaparsec scale. So there's a beauty in the distance ladder itself in that we're using the same measure measurements in multiple rungs for both the supernovae and the Cepheids, and that really uh, improves the robustness of our measurement. Uh, and so this is just kind of a really cool paper, but showing kind of just like how powerful just the idea of a distance ladder is. Okay, so for on the H naught side, 
we kind of felt like, hey, things are just not not moving much. And we really kind of tried looking at every possible thing. I'll show another plot about that in a second. On the W side, kind of as I was showing before, it's 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 harder. Um, w is just a much harder measurement for us than 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 H not. So our constraints on dark, on on matter, dark energy. So we get omega m is uh, a little bit kind of higher than than some analyses have seen. So we get 0.338 plus or minus 0.018. So Planck is like 0.31 plus or minus 0.01. So not any serious tension, but um, actually kind of had moved a good bit from kind of what we got in Pantheon. For, for W, uh, you know, we see kind of ourselves, one sigma from a W of minus one, the cosmological constant. If you combine with Planck, you're kind of bang on uh, a W of minus one. So from, for kind of a, a dark energy, dark matter side, we're not seeing any surprises. And we tried pushing to measuring WA. This is the evolution of dark energy. And in, the, in short, we 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 just can't constrain it very well. We see maybe a little bit of an interesting two sigma from zero if you combine with Planck and BAO, but it's 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 pretty weak. It, we really kind of need the next generation of surveys to to say anything interesting. So, for a dark energy point of view, we're seeing W of minus one. It kind of I don't know the same old same old story, and for H not we're seeing basically things just aren't moving much. Um, so this is this is showing basically uh, on the left is kind of all the variance in the H analysis. This includes Cepheid problems. On the right, this is just basically the supernova systematics. So you could see uh, in the pink lines here, that's the uncertainty on H naught. In, in these dots, this is basically everything that you know we could think of that that could that uh, all the systematics that go into our error budget and you know basically how much does this affect H naught? And you can see, you know, we're we're not close to the statistical uncertainty. And remember that the tension itself, you know, this scale here is minus 0.5. The tension is six. So that's you know off the slide here. So there's just not nothing that we can come up with um, or that's been pointed out to us that can significantly move. Um, the value of the Hubble constant, which is pretty remarkable that that it's kind of this robust. And this is after kind of doubling the sample size and such. Okay. Now, even so you can say, hey, maybe, maybe, I don't know, there's just still some unknown, unknown lurking. We kind of hear this a lot. So, so for the main Hubble constant measurement from the shoe scene, that's a three rung distance ladder. It's geometry to Cepheid, Cepheid to supernova, supernova to H naught. Now, what's kind of gotten very interesting from Pantheon Plus is that we have these very low red low red shifts. We spent a lot of time improving those red shifts, particularly nearby, and understanding kind of these bulk flow models. And we could say, all right, well, maybe supernova is the problem. Let's totally cut them out and go straight from Cepheids to H naught. So use the red shifts of the Cepheids, the the, the, the galaxies of Cepheids themselves, which is basically what you try to avoid in the three three rung because you're nervous about all these different kind of local peculiar velocities. So we do this, and this is a great paper led by Darcy Kenworthy, and you get these bigger uncertainties, but you actually get a very consistent value of the Hubble constant. So even if you completely cut out supernova from the process, which I'm not recommending as the, the best way to do it, that kind of puts my stuff out of, out of the limelight. Um, but if you do that, you, you still, you get the same value of each knot. And then there's been, uh, another interesting paper said, okay, well, people have pointed out that that there there might be problems in this kind of selection of the supernova sample that you that you do that you use and um, and uh, because we can only use supernovae that occur in galaxies that also have Cepheids and Cepheids only occur in star forming galaxies, so you might kind of have different selection effects. So there's a way to actually add a rung where you use um, uh, surface brightness fluctuations. You say, all right, now, now I'm going to be able to use all the supernova that go off in different kinds of hosts. And if you do that, actually, H naught goes up a little bit to 74.6. So if you try to either cut out supernova completely from the process, or if you try to use different, different supernovae that can't be used in the three rung measurement, either way, H naught's kind of not moving. 
Um, so, you know, I was going into this last analysis. I mean, there's kind of been so much back and forth about different things. You know, I, I did not know what we would kind of what we'd see, and it's it's amazing to me that that kind of things have firmed up in, in, in this way. Okay, so you know, just one one other thing I just want to hit is that uh, something that's kind of kind of popular now is that maybe just like our place in the universe is very weird. And there's, I don't know, something kind of like non-Copernican going on. Now, what's really amazing about supernovae is that we go all the way from supernovae like next door to supernovae very far out. And if there's anything that kind of particularly strange, you could you should see some kind of discontinuity. And we just, we don't see that. I mean, we have supernovae across the whole range, you know, with with, with fine detail. And we're just not seeing any kind of abrupt change. Like I'm not uh, closing the toy, closing the door on any, anything that's you know possibly weird, but it just you you have to look at the supernova data, and there's just nothing. There's no funny that that's popping out right now about where we are, or what's going on. Okay, so just just a quick shout out. So we release all of this this information. This has this has has lots of different stuff. Um, the link is here. Uh, and if you want to uh, email about any questions, just email me or Dylan. Okay, so I'm going to now switch quickly to to the shoes, to the kind of sh more shoes part of it, which I, and by that I mean more like the Cepheids part. And I'll go through this really quickly. Uh, so this is this is a big team uh, led by Adam and uh, had, had, a, had a number of great contributions from different people. Um, and really kind of what's, what's been amazing about this is it's just been a huge contribution from, from the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'll show a slide about that in a second. But basically, you know, we're trying to use kind of like the gold standards of, of tools. So we're using the best geometric methods and we're using kind of the best, you know, standard candle, Cepheids and supernovae. And we kind of do, you know, there's these differential measurements along the difference ladder. And we go into the near infrared, so you really reduce any of your sensitivity to things like dust. Um, and kind of one really new, new, nice thing now is we're really kind of propagating every statistical systematic error. And we can trace all the covariance. Um, so this is in total, um, about a thousand orbits on HST. And I'll just kind of show you this. Um, so it's just been kind of a one of a kind investment from the Hubble space telescope. And it just, we kind of call this like our last dance. It's just, it's hard to see what a next analysis or next sample could be. Because yeah, it just we we've we've gotten the investment, uh, we've we've analyzed it now, and you just can't kind of a, a doubling of this sample would take another I don't know twenty years or so. So this is kind of almost like this was it for us. So in this analysis, we doubled the supernova calibrators, so the second rung of the distance ladder. Um, there's a tripling of the Cepheid calibrators in NGC forty two fifty eight, one of the anchor rungs, and full data reprocessing. Um, uh, for this analysis, so not just kind of adding on this 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 the, this new sample, but kind of full uh, full reprocessing. Okay, so this is just kind of nice outline where we have these three rungs. In the first rung, there's kind of been a number of reanalyses of of those anchor measurements. In the second rung, you're tying shoes to Pantheon Plus, where you have the Cepheids and the supernovae, and uh, in the third rung, that's what I've talked about so far. That's that's the Pantheon Plus. So this is it includes a number of different kind of possible variations. Basically, anything the community has brought up, sixty-seven different variations, huge uh, data release, kind of what what we put out. Um, so yeah, please ask if you have any questions. And uh, a lot of work by one long here. Okay, this is just just one nice uh, artistic picture of kind of what this looks like. So these are all of the galaxies uh, in the second rung of the distance ladder. Um, so I actually, I, I, I got like this, this, uh, printed out and I have this huge thing on my wall in my office, just, just of this, uh, if anyone wants this to, uh, I, I, I could send them a link. It's quite cheap. Okay. Um, okay. So just kind of really quickly. So on the right here, you're seeing, uh, kind of where, where Cepheids are, uh, in these, in these different, uh, in these different ga galaxies. This is all of all the new hosts that we have supernovae in, um, inclu including kind of you have new Cepheids in NGC 4258, which is kind of a really important one for because it's in the first rung. Um, and, and for every galaxy, what you see on the right here is you're seeing the PL relation. So you could just kind of see by eye, you know, how, how robust this looks. 
Um, so, you know, some galaxies are a bit more sparse than others, but you know, for, for each one, we're kind of getting really good, accurate and precise measurements. Um, and on now here, the bottom left, these are the composite light curves of the Cepheids. Um, so this is kind of all the periods. And you can see, you know, these are real, real standard candles. There's just kind of nothing popping out that's changing between, um, between different galaxies. Okay. So, you know, one thing that, that, that keeps getting brought up is like maybe, well, the Cepheids could be different um, in galaxies in the first rung than in the second rung. So there's, there's kind of really nice tests that could be made to basically are the composite light curves of, of these Cepheids different for galaxies in um, the Milky Way versus the kind of what they, the extragalactic uh, Cepheids. And what's great is if you kind of separate this um, in terms of mean period, uh, then you could basically see what's called the Hirschsprung progression. So you could see that, that these little kind of bumps and wiggles, and those same bumps and wiggles are in the gal in the for the Cepheids in the Milky Way versus the Cepheids uh, that are extragalactic. So there's just kind of nothing that we're seeing that makes uh, uh, it seem like Cepheids just suddenly decide to change uh, when you get past the Milky Way, or really kind of when you get past like 40 megaparsecs, which is kind of what you need to change the Hubble tension. Uh, so it's just kind of these are these are standard candles, and they they really are holding up as as them. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so another thing that keeps getting brought up is well, maybe there's crowding. So there's just been a, kind of a lot of work from the Shoes team about about uh, understanding the impact of crowding. And the short answer is just kind of we're not seeing much effect. If you split the sample for high crowding regions, low crowding regions, there's just kind of not any differences. That, that we're seeing if you propagate that to H naught. So I mean, this is a this this is a difficult measurement, but you know we we have all these techniques to kind of separate so the Cepheid from the background light, and you know any kind of uh, jackknife type test that we do, you're, we're just not seeing any H naught thing. Um, so you know, putting this together, we uh, ultimately have 3,200 uh, Cepheids, 300 supernovae, and then we kind of have all this covariance and. This is kind of this is a really neat new thing where that we that we didn't have in the previous shoes analysis, which is that we could trace the covariance between kind of every galaxy, the kind of the Cepheids in them and the supernovae in them, and basically by propagating the impact of different systematics. So now, kind of when, if anyone wants to kind of use this this data and you want to determine your own H now your own W. We strongly encourage you to use the covariance matrix that we give with it, um, because that's really telling how the the measurements are related to each other. Um, so we then we we do that. We basically put this in the MCMC. We give code as part of our data release for you to do that, um, to, and it shows how to kind of run and make make the MCMC itself uh, if if you need. Um, okay, so kind of going back to then where I started, we get H nine seventy three five sigma tension from Planck. Um, and this is kind of just, you continue to improve analysis to after analysis. Um, and that's kind of like I did for supernova, give a couple more tests. Um, we have different geometric anchors that we use. If you say, all right, well, maybe you have a problem with the Milky Way one or the NGC 4258 one, you could use two of them and predict the third. And we get really great agreement now between the different anchors. So this, the agreement wasn't as strong in the NAS analysis. We said this was statistical fluctuations. And I think that holds up nicely. Um, we also kind of something that gets brought up quite, uh, consistently is any dependence on Cepheid metallicity, uh, and really kind of H naught is is insensitive to this. Part of that is because we can we measure this relation well, but the other part is just because Cepheids in our supernova host are so similar to the Cepheids in our anchor galaxies, you just can't get uh, much of a push on. Uh, on on H naught, so this is kind of again kind of how uh, why the distance ladder works so well is, is is by doing things consistently between rungs. Okay, so this is just showing on the bottom right here uh, H naught from from the different anchor galaxies. See great great things, and I just kind of give one uh, quick shout out to to um, uh, a new paper. This was led by Juan and all that actually is using uh, James Webb Space Telescope data. Which where crowding is not um, an issue, 
And we're seeing kind of very consistent results using JWST versus HST. So this is a great paper that just came out, kind of one of the first big, you know, H not use cases uh, uh, from JWST. And again, the results kind of couldn't be more encouraging. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so putting this all together, uh, we we go from geometry to the host of supernovae, we include the covariance, we then uh, propagate that with this formula with redshifts. And what we can now do is you could solve for H naught and Q naught or H naught and W, basically H naught, you know, the current expansion and then kind of how the universe has been chanting over time with, with Q naught. And uh, we get what you see on the right here. So not much dependence of H naught on Q naught, you know, a little bit as, as expected, but what's kind of amazing now is we can do this whole process simultaneously where uh, using kind of all the covariance between supernova across the entire redshift range. Okay, so right, so we have looked at kind of each possible thing that the community has brought up. So this nice plot on the left is showing uh, all the different what we call variants where you change something that, that might be possible. These are like systematics. And you kind of just see that it's just very hard to get below 72-ish or 72 and a half. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the systematics are kind of at uh, even a smaller level than our statistics. And it's just, there's nothing that, that kind of has been brought up that can significantly push, push, push H not down. Okay. So, you know, the summary then is, you know, we, we have done this huge sweep of the analysis. Uh, Cepheids look like good standard candles. Uh, the geometric anchors are consistent. Uh, we've kind of really pushed the, the supernova sample. We've looked at all the systematics and we just don't know what the Hubble tensions do do. So just kind of for a few minutes to talk about uh, what's going on. And I just kind of could say there was one paper that's coming out um, uh, from uh, a student that I work with, uh, which is that there still is this kind of lingering, um, a, a bit of a discrepancy between Cepheids and TRGB. And so kind of uh, a bunch of us are looking at this and it kind of go into kind of how you do the TRGP measurement. So here this is, you're having brightness versus color and you're basically trying to measure this tip. Um, and what's nice kind of what we're looking at is are these uh, galaxies where there's been multiple, there's been HST programs to measure the color magnitude diagrams um, for different fields on the galaxy and figure out kind of like we do for supernovae, how do you standardize them? Um, and uh, we're going to release all this, this data. So if kind of people want to kind of do TRGB measurements yourself, um, this will kind of make this really easy. So just look out, this will be in the archive next week. Um, uh, so it's kind of really nice thing. Um, so it's kind of a, a few other, uh, just other things. So what could be this, this be due to, I don't know. Um, so I, I am on the observer side. There's this great uh, uh, paper by Eleanor Di Valentino where she kind of does this, this compilation of what's going on. There are things, um, the one that kind of I'm most interested in is early dark energy. I think I have, yeah, this one side. So this is a signal that is seen from ACT, uh, which shows kind of three sigma evidence. It just so happens to kind of be like the perfect thing to explain the H naught tension. Uh, it is something that Planck does not seem to allow, um, but there seem to be some systematic disagreements between Planck, Planck and ACT. Um, so I, I, uh, uh, it's something to keep your eye on. I, 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 I'm excited by it, but I don't know, you know where this one, but ACT has a lot more data coming up. Okay, so lastly, kind of there's a lot of use cases for supernovae coming. This is just this nice uh, decadal paper that we did to show kind of supernovae useful for H naught, for W, for, they're going to be useful for F sigma eight for uh, time uh, strong lensing time delays. So it's just kind of it's it's a really kind of fun time to be in this. Um, and then I referred to this in the beginning that there is this this other tension which is the S eight tension, and you can see actually supernovae have played a part of this, but there but this this tension keeps growing too. So it's not just kind of the H not tension anymore. There's this other tension. Okay, so my last slide. What's next? Um, there's just a lot more. Super, type 1a supernova analysis coming the the shoes analysis is kind of done i mean we'll, we'll keep improving systematics but but they you know we we kind of did our last big thing um you have this jwst launch so 
uh, we have these new observations, we've kind of already seen some improvements for Cepheid uh, systematics. Uh, there'll be this new paper on TRGB uh, soon, and I kind of really encourage you know, people to, uh, to look at it. I think it's, it's really interesting. There'll be different lens LIGO uh, results, hopefully in the next couple of years. And then just kind of any more ideas in the community. We're really kind of trying to take everything in and you know, figure out what's going on here. So I'll stop there and open up for questions. So thank you so much. Yeah, Dan was an excellent talk, especially impressive amount of uh, observations and uh, data. So now the you can ask your question by raising your hand or by writing your question in the chat. We have already one raised hand and one question in the chat. Let's go first with the question in the chat and then to the raised hand. So it's from Bocena Czerny, which intrinsic extinction curves were tested for distant supernovae. Yeah, okay. Um, which extinction, yeah. So this is one of my favorite topics. Um, so, it, this is a this is a, a serious issue for supernova right now is is understanding type one a supernova extinction and basically previously the, what, what we did was we used from supernova itself we modeled what the extinction curve is so we kind of we we didn't use like CCM or you know Fitzpatrick or anything we inferred it from directly kind of from supernovae and kind of how how they behave. There's been a, a lot of back and forth about what is the kind of what's the color of supernovae due to, and whether how much is kind of intrinsic, uh, some you know intrinsic reddening versus kind of what is kind of normal dust that we see. And so uh, Dylan Brown and I put out a paper a couple of years ago, basically saying more of it is Milky Way kind of dust like than we thought, but that it appears like the RV value that we see varies quite a bit for, between different galaxies. And for there, we're kind of assuming, basically assuming a range of F98 or the Dallas Telling, uh, sorry, a range of RV, uh, but basically kind of scaling something like Fitzpatrick. So this is, uh, I think, kind of the most important issue. If kind of you have thoughts, you know, this uh, there's actually going to be like a, a conference in a few weeks at Harvard kind of about this stuff. But uh, at least on the W side, this is the top systematic is kind of what extinction to use. And we're, we're trying to be almost like ag, as uh, conservative as we can. So we say, here, let's kind of have a range of RV or not a range and, and a completely propagate that to systematics. Now we have a rise hand from uh, Ward Manchester. Willie, can you unmute him, please, Ward? Uh, there we go. Um, thank you. I just had a quick question about the uh, Cepheid systematics and even the type 1a supernovae for that matter. Where do numerical simulations play a role in terms yeah. of predicting these brightnesses? Right, great question. Okay, so I yeah, I, I refer to a lot to simulations, but the simulations that I refer to are always catalog level. So basically we have these kind of empirical models of either Cepheids or supernovae. And like for supernovae, you know, we we have models of kind of how they how they change and what what they depend on and then all like the telescope properties uh and then we we simulate from there but we're not starting from like any kind of serious physics and i could speak to the 1a side a a, a, a bit for the for the 1a side when i talk to to uh kind of real modelers um they're kind of actually going to explosion physics they can't seem to get supernovae to be as good standard candles as we actually measure. Um, so it's actually kind of surprising empirically that they are such good standard candles. Like there's something that's still happening with the explosion that makes them more the same. That's at least of the people that I work with, but the kind of communities of like the real numerical simulation people and kind of my community, they, we've been, I don't know, saying we'll meet and it just, it, we're, we're still a distance apart. Okay, there is one more question also in the chat. Could violation of the cosmological principle explain some of these discrepancies? Yeah, so so this is kind of I think I don't know. It's like the most talked about thing now. If yeah, if 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 violating the cosmological principle does it, I I I, I I'm a bit nervous about about it. So one what I was trying to say before was you know we do have supernovae kind of nearby, further away. 
we're not seeing any kind of serious funnies. So actually in the Pantheon Plus cosmology paper, we break up the sky into patches and maybe there's kind of one patch that, you know, it's a little bit different and that's in the direction of the CMB. And there's been a number of papers saying some things in that direction are also kind of strange. I, 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 I'm open to this because like the, yeah, there's other analyses that are kind of pointing at interesting things in specific directions. But one thing we do for for H naught is we we you know one we're taking supernova across the sky and two we make cuts so we only take supernova kind of a dis a, a decent bit away from us like past Z of 0 0.023 so you, if there was any under over density you're kind of less sensitive to it and you know H naught doesn't change so much so I don't know like I I, I there's 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 a there's a lot going on in this area there's actually like a big conference just about that one question and. So I, I, but I, I haven't seen like this, the uber convincing thing that this is, this is it. Uh, there is one more question from Rob, Rob Jeddick. Sorry if I misspelled the name. You said that survey selection biases modeled. Can you explain why it matters? Right. Uh, yeah. For the supernova selection. So you, there's just kind of a normal uh, Momquist bias where if uh, you have these surveys that are trying to discover supernovae and um, it has some threshold of what it calls a uh, discovery or what it decides to follow up to get spectroscopic follow-up for. And um, to pass that threshold, you need to be of some brightness. So you're basically just selecting brighter objects. So kind of one thing we, we spend a ton of time on is kind of modeling exactly how that selection works and then kind of correcting for any kind of Momquist bias. Um, it's uh, on the low redshift side, it's not that bad, but, but for kind of higher redshift, uh, when you're trying to measure W, it can get pretty rough. Okay, so we still have a few more questions here. Now it starts to become more hot. Let's go still with one, um, one more question here. One more, the last one, let's take the last one. The universe is not homogeneous. Uh, on any scale, surely this violates the basic assumption of every model. Could this be relevant? And then yeah, so, let's yeah, see, right. So with all the questions, <laughs> yes, yeah. please. Yeah, and so yes, I mean, if if you want to break the 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 the, the cosmological principle, you know, then I guess kind of all bets are loose. Are are are, 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 are every every everything's on. So yeah, you can get a lot of leverage if you want to break that kind of one of our main assumptions here is the cosmological principle. So if it turns out like the Hubble tension can be explained by um, you know, the breaking of, of, of that, then I, you know, we still did our job, like, and just that's, that, that's the problem. We're not, we're just not seeing great evidence of the cosmological principle kind of breaking anywhere. When we look around, I don't know, things look kind of boring, but um, yeah, we just, we're, we're just putting it out as we see it. Well, there are actually two more questions. Should we go still for one of them or? I, I'm, I, I got nothing else to do, so it's up to you. So uh, HO changes uh, because of the expansion so that uh, we have to see the, the changes with time. Yeah, right. So yeah, so uh, Hubble content is a number of, 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 you know, what the universe looks like, you know, today. You know, so it's not like, yes, see, the, the name constant's bad, but... Um, when we measure kind of H naught and Q naught, you know, we are kind of putting into our model, we're letting the data say, tell our model kind of how, how it's changing with time. And when we do that, then, yeah, we just don't see so much sensitivity to H naught. Um, but that's kind of, you know, what's, what's awesome about kind of having supernovae for both, uh, you know, in the distance ladder and kind of the Hubble diagram is that we could kind of trace those covariances and we could kind of see how things change with time and let the data constrain that. Since uh, we did not receive more questions, let's read in this case also the last one, <laughs> yeah. which, uh, well, the last, it's not the last one, but the last, let's say, in my list. Uh, in addition to the extinction in the supernova host, it uh, is inter intergalactic extinction ever considered. And then there are metals yeah. in the intergalactic median, and there could be dust, presumably gray extinction. And then how significant right. would gray extinction affect the age? the Hubble constant. 
Right. So I, yes, great question. So I wrote a paper with Ariel Gubar um, five-ish years ago on this. Um, I tried to yeah, look at kind of any kind of intergalactic um, extinction. It it seemed a bit more open actually with Pantheon because we there's like a, a little bit of a signal with Pantheon. With Pantheon Plus, the, I think the evidence for it has gone down. We haven't looked again um, for... I think what's what's hard is that if you do have this, then it should kind of build in some way with with you know as you go out with distance, but then your supernovae constrain it. For the Hubble tension, your stuff is kind of so nearby that you know that intergalactic uh, stuff had, would have to pick up, pick up pretty fast, and we're not seeing such we're not seeing kind of I think any good evidence for that, but. Um, it could be used to be looked at again. Um, but yeah, if you look up I know, Goober Skolnick or something, um, yeah, we had a paper about this. Okay, dear Dan. So uh, let's stop here. Thank you once more for this excellent talk. And I would like to remind to everyone that this was now our last, last online seminar on our series on cosmology and captivating cosmology from the Big Bang to tomorrow. And starting on November 24th, we start our new uh, online series on space environmental hazards, mitigation and prediction. So we are looking very much forward to see you again following our online seminars. And then thank you once more and hope to see you in Bernier. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye to everyone.